let's get into it. Okay, here. All right, uh, keep going. All right, so I, if, if there's nothing else you get out of this conversation, it's gonna be the, um, the, the orientation around systems thinking as an approach towards dealing with this issue. Um, I, my understanding from your group is that um, y'all are actually thinking beyond pure energy in terms of priorities that you're holding and your approach to passive house, or at least many of you in, in this group, which is fabulous. I'm super excited to hear that. Although I've been doing, doing energy modeling for years and years and years, and it is not uncommon um, to just try to reduce everything into numbers and columns on spreadsheets <clears throat> and to try to quantify and ultimately sort of fall back into a somewhat reductionist sort of perspective, even when we're dealing with big, big issues and big, big topics like counting carbon. Um, so really, I, I just want to start this entire conversation framing it from as interdisciplinary and interconnected and systems of a perspective as possible. Because uh, that's really the perspective that's required to understand the extent and, and depth of the, the issue of, you know, rapid climate change that we're trying to deal with. So, you know, my simple pitch is that making carbon storing buildings is the most impactful action that our community, the ABC community can take in addressing climate change, not just reducing our impact, but actually creating carbon storing buildings. But the actual, you know, systems approach to that uh, is, is, quite, is quite complicated. It really requires us to change our thinking and change our entire approach to the way we, um, you know, the way we work with buildings. Uh, next, I'll keep going here. And so, you know, the, the thing we're trying to address in the context of creating carbon storing buildings is the climate impact of our structures. Um, and, you know, I'm presuming prior knowledge in this group that um, you know, everyone got wind of the IPCC's report that came out last fall and our own government's report, um, highlighting the dramatic need for urgent change here. Um, the simple message around that is that we have you know, too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the more complex um, problem behind that is the why. It's the, um, you know, the, the structure of our economic system that has allowed, you know, a select few power holders to create uh, a fossil fuel based economy that has brought us all into this place of complacency with the amount of carbon loading that has, that has happened through the direct the creation of the built environment. So when we're talking about the problem, it's not merely getting carbon dioxide molecules out of the atmosphere. There is a much larger roots to that, to what led that imbalance of the carbon cycle on our planet in the first place. And it's important to acknowledge that to look at what the, the real solutions to that are. And so, you know, the simple message on how to deal with climate change in the building environment is to drastically reduce the emissions. And we're being told from the, the international scientific community that we have about a decade or so within which to make really, really sub substantial cuts in our emissions. Um, but to achieve that, and this is what I mean by systems perspective, it's not just going to be a matter of swapping in and out certain materials or just ramping up our uh, air sealing measures and calling it good. Um, it's building as usual as our approach to developing uh, buildings and roads and communities is it's just simply not going to work. We're going to have to be uh, more creative and um, more uh, aggressive, for lack of a better word, and the extent to which we're willing to uh, reach beyond our little silos, not just as architect or builder or engineer, but reaching beyond our industry to all the way through the supply chain back to where materials come from and really addressing the direct ecological sources and impacts for the material decisions that we make. Uh, and as well as seeing how these decisions are impacted by and impact um, issues of social justice and climate justice, and that uh, you know all of these issues are deeply connected and are ultimately ours to respond to. Next, uh, we can keep going here. All right, let's stop here. So, <clears throat> I want to sort of put this into some bit of uh, perspective in terms of how some of these different problems and accordingly the solutions can be connected to each other. Because uh, we do tend to have a, have a habit of looking at kind of one problem at a time, whether it's indoor air quality or um, you know, affordability or you know, low energy performance, et cetera, et cetera. Although again, the passive house community I think is more adept than, than most at being able to juggle more than two balls at once. 
Um, this is a quote from uh, this fabulous book, Farming While Black, that a, a good friend and colleague of ours wrote, Leah Penniman. Uh, they're, uh, she's with Soul Fire Farm, and their organization is devoted to the intersection of sustainable agriculture, um, racial justice, and food justice. This is a fabulous organization that really looks at that type of intersectionality. She writes, organic matter and soils on the plains plummeted by 50% in only one generation of white settler colonialism. I realized that all our efforts to heal, heal the soil entailed the restoration of organic matter and was, in effect, a decolonization of the soil. We were inviting our non-human relations back onto the land and back into relationship with us. And that just really, for me, crystallized this relationship between um, uh, social impacts and ecological impacts and how these pieces are, are always, always deeply and um, deeply connected and are ultimately one and of the same. And so the, the reason I mention all of this, well, there, there's a few reasons. On the highest level, it's that I, it's, it, we do run the risk as we're all starting to orient around what is this concept of, or of embodied carbon and what does it mean to have climate impact beyond just the energy performance of our buildings? We run the risk of just being hyper-focused again on this you know, purely on the climate and purely on the atmosphere. And it's just really critical to remember that there are social impacts to all of these decisions that are, that are the result of the same, uh, the same problems that led to carbon imbalance in our atmosphere. And soil is a good segue to the next slide. Um, this really, it all comes down to soil. Um, when we start looking at what the greatest impacts, negative impacts are and our greatest potential for being able to, uh, to turn our buildings into carbon sinks. Um, really, when we talk about any renewable material, when we talk about any, any of the, like, the rock star materials that we're, um, I'll sort of spin us through, um, that have the potential to, to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then train it in, their, in the bodies of these plants and then also into the soil as well, they are all reliant upon healthy soil. Um, our food, all reliant upon healthy soil. And we can, I mean, there, there's a whole <laughs> multi-week long, uh, you know, presentation that could just be looking at the critical role of soil. But it's so easy for us to be so deeply disconnected from that in, in, in the world of buildings, which is often displacing soil just in their creation, but also in our work, you know, in offices, in urban environments, working in lots where agriculture or forestry just may not really be on the radar. Um, and it's really, it's uh, not only is it a vital and green, it's just fascinating to look at soil as a metaphor, uh, again, for all these concepts around um, systems approaches to things. I mean, soil is, the, is that, that liminal place where the inorganic and the organic communities interface. It's this place where, you know, the subterranean and superterrestrial ecosystems um, you know, coalesce and there's a tremendous amount of transfer of water and nutrients and, and molecules um, from the ground into the sky and back that happens within that soil layer. Um, and, you know, hold, hold on to that for a minute because as we start really unpacking the potential of our buildings to become carbon sinks, we see that a huge part of that is the role of architecture and construction and actually helping to support soil conservation. And so when we look at the different carbon, uh, carbon sinks of the planet, carbon moves in a cycle across, across, our, uh, across our planet. Um, you can see the ocean holds a tremendous amount of, um, of carbon. Uh, fossil fuels hold a, also a significant amount, although the more we burn them, the more they move up into the atmospheric bucket. Um, and the, the pedologic is that, that um, that soil and deep geologic layer uh, or sort of, you know, sink of carbon. And then the biotic would be us. We're all carbon-based life forms. So we all fit into that 1.2%. Um, and that carbon cycles across these different sinks as it, um, you know, as our, as our planet goes through its natural ecological processes. Um, and what we can see is that the, the soil, uh, this is actually a, a, a pretty good <laughs> representation of how plants work to store carbon. There's a whole lot of carbon that's stored in the plant itself, but there's even more that is uh, stored into the soil when plants are going through their photosynthetic process of pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so we see it's, it's one thing to work with plants because they store carbon, and that's, you know, that's a key part of this idea of carbon sink buildings. But it's even more important to recognize how much more carbon is stored in healthy soil uh, than in the plants themselves. And again, this comes back to the system's perspective of if we're really working from the, um, 
from the place of trying to address atmospheric carbon uh, and reduce the loading of that, like we we're immediately pulling ourselves into just understanding soil science, plant science, um, really the, those like macroecological sciences become the, the playing field in which we're operating um, and become part of what we need to uh, caretake uh, as we interface with supply chains and, and understanding where materials are coming from. And I'll get into a lot more detail around that as we move forward. So yes, we are going to have to get a little more literate around earth science to make sure that you know, the decisions that we're making are actually legitimately having a good impact and not just uh, yielding a whole bunch of negative unintended consequences. All right, so let's get into this piece around embodied carbon. I've already dropped that term a couple of times. Let's just start with some good old definition of terms. So when I say embodied carbon, that's actually shorthand for carbon dioxide, which in and of itself is shorthand for carbon dioxide equivalents. And so if you see, you'll see this uh, um, CO subscript two subscript E, that E is because carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas that gets released. Um, it's not the only thing that leads to the global warming potential in our materials and in our buildings. Um, there's a host of other chemicals that, are, that have even you know, much, much larger, actually hold on there for a second, that have even much larger impacts. Uh, for example, some of the propellants um, in various, um, uh, um, uh, like a spray products uh, can have a magnitude of a thousand or more times the impact of carbon dioxide. So we need to make all these gases equivalent to the same unit for comparison. And so we use carbon dioxide as the, as the base metric. And so when, uh, when you see CO2E, that's just being super clear that it's really looking at the total global warming potential of all the different greenhouse gas um, emittance uh, from a given uh, material or building. And when we talk about the embodied phase, this is now really starting to look at the full life cycle impacts of a material or of a building. Um, and there's a couple of ways of defining embodied carbon. Uh, one is the actual total life cycle impact from the moment the raw materials are extracted out of the ground all the way through disposal and demolition. Um, the way that we tend to define it in, in the, for the purposes of this conversation, when we're specifically talking about um, materials and building impact, we're often putting boundaries around that to the, the early phase of a material's life. And that's looking at uh, what's called cradle to gate, uh, essentially raw material extraction through the point that a material has been manufactured and the gate of the factory. And so that's generally the, the, those two red circles sort of uh, highlight the, the boundaries of the full life cycle of the building or the materials that we're gonna be talking about. Okay, that's next. Okay, so why does that actually matter? Well, if you look at the graph on the left and we're looking at the global carbon dioxide emissions by sector, we see that um, of the building, um, you know, the building industry is responsible, is responsible for close to 40% of that, depending on whose numbers you use. Uh, and so within that, we see the building operations, and this would be primarily energy. We're mostly here talking about the, the CO2 emissions as a result of the energy consumption for heating, cooling, lighting, ventilating, et cetera, powering our buildings. And the materials and construction have this relatively smaller percentage. And that kind of makes sense. We have a whole lot more buildings that are in existence, you know, huffing and puffing all winter long, um, then we have new buildings being constructed. However, you have the, gap, the graph on the right, and we start putting in the time factor of those emissions releases, and we start to see that, okay, that may be so, but operational emissions are cumulative slowly over the course of time on an annual basis. Whereas all of the emissions that came from that early phase, the, the embodied carbon emissions, primarily from um, the, the production of materials. And then again, depending where you put their, that boundary, can also be transportation, can also be construction phase emissions. That all happens prior to occupancy. And so there is a really, really high priority that needs to be placed on not just the, the amount of, of um, uh, CO2 emissions, but the time frame in which the, they are emitted, because what we've learned, again, we've got about a decade to deal with this. Um, and we just simply cannot net zero energy our way out of this problem. The atmosphere is already overloaded with carbon dioxide. And so to ignore the entire amount of these 
this first bloom of um, or or sort of you know release of of emissions from the pre-occupation phases of the building means we're we're not only missing an enormous part of the process we're missing the most important ones if we're looking at this um, with a, a as a time sensitive issue to deal with and that, that's where the, the that time factor uh, becomes critical in prioritizing. Um, the reduction of embodied carbon emissions. Next. All right, so where do those come from? We're largely talking about materials. And I'm going to just say for the sake of this conversation, we're just going to really keep our focus pretty narrowed on materials because our time is quite limited. And um, our greatest potential for turning buildings into carbon sinks, I would argue, really does come from addressing the material part of the of the life cycle of a building. And so in looking at that, um, we look at a sort of a host of different materials here. XPS and EPS are two different flavors of foam, uh, foam board, rigid foam board. CCSPF is closed cell spray polyurethane foam. The HFC blowing agent is the sort of kind of general current blowing agent that's used in most projects. The HFO is a newer blowing agent that is becoming more and more popular. It's a, it's a chemical family. Um, there's a, a bunch of different trade names out there. Um, and they advertise as being a zero global warming potential, blowing, warming potential blowing agent. And it is, but blowing agents are not the entirety of the foam product. So that's why you still see a pretty substantial um, uh, carbon emission, even from the, the low emitting closed cell spray foam. And then you have some mineral board in there, vacuum panels, aerogel, and one of these, hempcrete, is actually a substantial negative number. Uh, next. So yes, this jumps out. Um, and you know, as natural builders, we've been working with plant-based materials you know, for a host of different reasons for our whole careers, always knowing that there was you know, this amazing thing that plants do in, in photosynthesizing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and helping to be a low carbon material. But it wasn't until we really started crunching the numbers that we saw the tremendous potential of using these, uh, using these materials as a legitimate carbon storing uh, strategies for our buildings. Next. All right, let's look at this. So as I've been saying, during photosynthesis, this is like biology, ninth grade, bringing you back like it never left. Photosynthesis uh, is the process by which plants um, absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and not on, this is like this critical part of the carbon cycle of our, of our, of our planet's, um, you know, our planet's systems. Um, plants serve this phenomenal role of pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. We were, you know, we've got think tanks investing millions of dollars of inventing, you know, next generation space age carbon scrubbing technology. And we have that right now, they're plants. Um, and so we tend to think of plants, particularly in all of the conversation around mass timber and trees and using sustainable trees, they're like, oh, there is so much carbon in that material of the plant itself. And there is, that is true. But as we learned earlier, when we're looking at, um, you know, the potential for carbon to be stored, there is actually a significant amount more potential carbon storage into the soil itself. Um, and for, for those of you that are familiar with uh, Project Drawdown, which is the very uh, extensive and heavily thoroughly researched pro um, uh, research project in which they evaluated the top um, solutions for reversing climate change. Um, within the top 10, I would say a good 30% of them, don't quote me, but a good chunk of them all relate to sustainable agricultural and silvicultural practices that support positive soil developments. Um, and that soil really does become, become the link. Um, so when we're looking at great, let's use plants in an effective way as part of this carbon storing solution. It's not just the plants themselves, it really does come back to the ecological system in which those plants uh, are managed. Next. <clears throat> so there's a whole bunch of these different types of materials. Um, timber, right off the bat, and Lord knows there's a, a 101 different ways of incorporating timber into a building, but trees are just really big plants. Uh, wood fiber board we call out sort of specially because it's, a, it's its own sort of classification of types of material that we're seeing many more options of wood fiber insulation products from rigid boards to loose fill to bats. Cork is actually, I love cork as a, as a um, metaphor for all of this. Um, the, the cork um, as, a, as an insulating and finish material, flooring material, 
siding material even, paneling, <laughs> comes from uh, the bark of trees that stay, that, that, that um, you know, stay alive even through the harvesting of the bark. It's kind of unique to that tree. But beyond that, looking at the, the industry and the, um, sort of the, the economic um, model for the cork industry, it's actually it, m largely grown in the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal and Spain. And they've seen as cork has been replaced in many cases by plastic, for example, wine stoppers. Um, <clears throat> we're finding that uh, a lot of cork forests are actually succumbing to, to housing development pressure because the market is not is just not there um, or, or hasn't been as it has been in the past. And so the greater threat to that forest productivity is not actually the overconsumption, it's the lack of markets and, and the competitive economic value of changing land use from from a working landscape to a developed landscape. Um, and so looking at those types of models becomes quite fascinating um, when we're looking at, you know, really trying to unpack the potential of, of a given material and how we prioritize uses of this material versus that. It can be quite regionally specific. Um, but moving right along, we've got cellulose, we've got straw. Um, straw, we'll look at in a second, we use in all sorts of different ways. Rice hulls, coconut choir, hemp, these are all examples of um, basically agriculture residues, um, secondary, tertiary, or waste um, product streams from um, a, a primary food um, crop. Um, and there's a whole lot of additional biomass that <coughs> is um, residual to that primary crop, which can quite effectively be reincorporated or even sort of upcycled into a high value insulation product or finished product. Um, and many, many more. Man, we could talk all day long just about materials, but that just gives you a survey. One note there, the and no red list chemicals. Okay, you can absolutely throw red list chemicals at anything. So don't get me wrong, you could turn any of these into something toxic with the incorrect binder or finish treatment. However, most of these materials are inherently zero VOC and non-toxic. And so for those of you that are working, say, in more uh, commercial or larger building environments for whom indoor air quality and LEED certification or well certification or, or green guard um, you know, specification becomes important. Um, you tend to see that as a higher value add than in the residential market. Great. You may not be able to have a value proposition for your client uh, for a, uh, a natural material by virtue of its carbon storage, but you absolutely can by virtue of its um, you know, certification status for your, your next, you know, lead driven project. And so those types of stack benefits are exactly the types of, uh, you know, solutions that we're looking for where we can solve more than one problem at the same time. All right, next one. And they're not all bio-based. There are definitely mineral-based solutions as well. I'm not as well versed in these, but there's a bunch out there. Uh, actually, one of the more popular ones, Carbon Cure, I don't have up here, um, but there's, there's a series of different um, aggregate materials, carbonate and blue planet, um, that are, are creating um, lightweight calcium carbonate aggregate from um, the, uh, the carbon dioxide that is pulled out of um, industrial smokestack uh, scrubbers. And so um, there, it's sort of a byproduct um, where that carbon dioxide can be reincorporated into a aggregate. Um, carbon Cure is quite cool. They take that same carbon dioxide pulled out of the uh, industrial um, sort of stream and use that as a curing agent in concrete to reduce the Portland cement content um, of, the, of, the, of the mix. And so that not only repurposes that carbon dioxide and, and stores it in a pretty permanent fashion, but it's actually reducing the emissions of the concrete by displacing the amount of Portland cement which is needed, which is the highest emitting ingredient of concrete. Uh, most of the, the, the impact of the carbon potential of, of concrete is in the Portland cements, less so for the, the sand and gravel. Um, and then there's also these other, Chris knows much more about these last two. He worked with a, a student of his at the Endeavor Center from Ghana, uh, where they make um, concrete there using palm kernel ash and palm kernel shell as an aggregate, and it's a plant-based concrete. When we talk about concrete, we take it for granted that it's Portland cement bound, but concrete uh, it can be earthen based, it can be lime based, there's a, it's a pretty generic term and there's, there's bio based uh, charred plant materials that can be formulated into pozzolans to create concrete as well. So again, there's, there's a whole lot out there that we're just barely beginning to start to scratch the surface on in terms of materials. 
Okay, next. All right, so let's get into some of the data because this is a passive house crowd and y'all love data. So Chris and I, uh, Chris Magwood from the Endeavor Center, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we teamed up and did a pretty thorough research project in which we looked at two different model buildings, 2,000 square foot um, single family residence, uh, one story with a basement, a full finished basement, and then a eight unit, four story, uh, more kind of, you know, uh, slightly larger kind of mid-sized building. Um, and we took these two buildings and we looked at four different enclosure types. Uh, and those enclosures ran from really high emitting materials, basically kind of like the worst decisions that you could make, but you know, not going out of your way, all very common materials. But you know, if you were to use all the highest emitting materials, we looked at the same shells if it was using kind of, kind of normal, so quote unquote average materials like, you know, fiberglass bad insulation, um, you know, standard, um, wood studs, you know, asphalt shingles, vinyl siding, that kind of a thing. Then we looked at the lowest emitting, the shell made from the lowest emitting materials that were easily commonly accessible. Um, and then those of the absolute super, super lowest, like we're really trying to create a carbon storing building. So we looked at those four different packages of, of materials for creating these buildings. We also looked at them as if they were code minimum construction as well as um, uh, basically approximating passive house, in very high performance uh, shell. Um, we, and then we looked at, the, well, that's enough for now. We'll get into the graphs and I can explain a little bit more. And so the sources of data all came from what are called EPDs, environmental product declarations. Um, we sort of had a hierarchy of the quality of the data that we used, industry averages for North America, um, where that was available or there was a very sort of boutique or specific material and then we could get EPD information for that particular material, we'd rely on that. If we, there were not North American um, EPDs available, we would reference European uh, materials of which there's a lot more uh, data. Um, if there were no EPDs available, um, we would either look at LCA data from just some good quality peer reviewed sources or we'd use the inventory for carbon and energy database. And that came down to places like straw or some of these agricultural products where there is not a trade industry that has funded the development of an EPD for straw or for hemp. Um, so that was our data sourcing. And there was a lot of, there's a lot of details in here around being able to validate and accurately compare different EPDs. There's a whole conversation in there. And for those of you that really like to geek out on data sourcing, we can absolutely go there uh, later or you know, off call. All right, next. So in looking at those four different shell types, again, the red is the highest embodied carbon materials like brick cladding, closed cell foam insulation, XPS, steel framing, so, you know, steel studs, that kind of a thing. Um, and again, the, the CC is the code compliant, the HP is the high performance, um, and the MF is the multifamily, and the, the SF is the single unit. Um, and we're looking just the embodied carbon of those shells. We fixed the area of the, the, the treated floor area and then allowed the roof and the foundation to expand and contract relative to the changes in the thickness of the wall assembly and of the roof assembly based on the different R values of the material. So this is all normalized to a set interior square footage and towards the uh, towards set R values. So we're pretty thorough in, in kind of being able to accurately compare across these different material profiles. And so as you can see, yep, the, uh, the high, uh, what's really interesting is not unlike uh, EUIs, it is uh, a lot easier to reduce your impact in a larger building with higher occupancy than a smaller building. So that's a good kind of pattern to recognize. But also if you're using carbon storing materials, uh, you use more of them and you store more. And that's where you see the difference where this from the closed, from the uh, code compliant to the high performance, um, really a lot of that changes insulation um, and some other changes due to the uh, enclosure thickness. Uh, and if those are high emitting materials, then your emissions go up as you increase their consumption, uh, ironically in the pursuit of a, of a better uh, energy performing enclosure. Uh, hey, Jacob, I'm going to butt in here because I think this is a really important graph. And, you know, the first time I saw this image, uh, I think that's sort of what struck me was actually seeing it in a relative sense of value. Um, because, you know, in the passive house community, I think that we're really 
focused on the energy metrics of performance. Um, there's a lot of ways to achieve a passive house certification. It's not dependent upon the materiality of your choices. And I think this graph does the best job I've seen of expressing how the choices that you make for that pass house assembly really do make a difference if our goal is, you know, approaching this drawdown and approaching like how we can build the best buildings that we can. So I just want to like point toward that 400 number where, you know, if we have a high performance building and we're doing say fully foamed out situation and we're, we're not utilizing timber, we're not utilizing cellulose, we're not utilizing straw or any of these other kind of natural materials, you know, this is where we end up and we might actually be working against our actual goal. Absolutely. Thanks for drawing attention to that. And, and in a minute, we'll look at some comparisons of the, what well, we're going to weave in the, the operational file here. But yeah, that is really, that is, that's such the thing. And then remember, this is all what is released into the atmosphere or stored from it, depending on your material choice, prior to occupancy. So all of this loading comes, you know, at, at day zero. And again, if we're, it, I, I like that you mentioned goal, and that's really what it comes down to. If the goal is a net zero operational energy as defined by the meter, or if it's if the goal is to create a passive house um, and which is validated by the modeling, then um, well, you're only going to have impacts pursuant to that goal. If the goal is actual climate impact, then that's the goal. Then we really need to evaluate uh, the data of the impact of our of our projects relative to that goal, which is actual net carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. Um, and that's uh, when we really started looking at that data, we're like, oh, look at that 400. That's, uh, that's a thing compared to that negative 170 for the same performance building. All right. So what is this? Well, and here? also if I can just add one more thing, Jacob, I, I guess I asked that question sort of make that clear with also the caveat that like, you know, we as architects are still trying to approach that goal of having fully foam free assemblies and we're, we're not necessarily achieving it in all areas. It's not always, it's not necessarily the perfect all the time. Sometimes the perfect can get in the way in the good, but we understand what our goal is now, I think in a better way. And so I guess I want to help everyone realize that like, as you get through these projects, as you're trying to design, um, depending on who you're speaking to, this might not rise to the surface. And it's a good right. reason to have you on this call tonight. Cause like even us in our studio, like we're approaching passive house in a way now that we have, I don't think we just choose to now, but at the time, you know, like those foam insulated slips panels were the best way to achieve it in our climate. And I think that we understand right. it in a different way now. Yep. That's a great point. And, you know, just to play off that and a couple of really key kind of takeaways since you just queued it up so well. Um, oh man, the perfect can absolutely be the enemy of the good and it's super easy to get discouraged and it's easy to start looking at this and be like, oh my God, I've been a part of the problem for all of these years. Really, the first place to start is just having the awareness. Just, you know, there are many, many, many cases, even in my own practice, we blow spray foam into, uh, as part of a retrofit and weatherization work that we just, we cannot find another solution in many of these cases. So it doesn't mean we don't do it. But it does mean that we try to hold some awareness of what that impact is and we do everything we can to mitigate it within the boundaries and restraints of that given project and to inform decision making for future projects. And so it really does just start by just coming from an honest place of awareness and just recognizing and daylighting some of those impacts and really just starting from that place. Um, all right, so but then looking at that in scale, and this is where it gets really interesting depending on the scale of building you use or, or build for those of you that are, you know, in urban environments working in really large buildings, you know, there's very few stakeholders that control a tremendous amount of power around that development and can make really big decisions with, you know, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, just convincing one or two people. But when you look in the single family in the small building realm, that power is dispersed over, you know, millions of different little projects all across the country. And if you're really at it, so it's easy to be like, oh, it's just one house. But if you look at, if we were to look at all of the new low rise residential construction in the US for the year 2017 and played it out through those different scenarios, the worst case scenario where it's the equivalent of 23 um, coal plants chugging all year long. And if we were to build all of that construction out of the best carbon storing materials we have available, we could take 10 coal plants offline. Um, and that was, you know, in the case of the province of Ontario, they actually took eight of their coal plants offline through a combination of renewable and consumption reduction initiatives over a long period of time. So it's not just a theoretical exercise. There are, you know, there are ways of being able to, uh, you know, 
uh, influence the extent to which our grid is managed partially from a demand driven side. All right, moving on. So that brings all sorts of questions. If we're starting to look at that scale around the potential to be able to, you know, for example, looking at straw, I love straw. I've been a straw builder for, oh gosh, going on 20 years now. Um, and I really do see it as holding a very, very important role. Um, uh, and ag, ag residue as a general classification of materials is, you know, in general. Um, but, you know, there is over 2 million tons of grain straw grown globally in 2016. That could replace all of the insulation materials currently being used in buildings globally. Uh, and it's equivalent carbon storage to offset all of the greenhouse gas transportation emissions. I think that's just of the U.S. Um, so, you know, that's real. And for those of you that are thinking of straw purely from the, you know, when I say building with straw, um, if you, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that for no small number of you, it brings to mind kind of lumpy walls in a small cottage in a rural environment, you know, built by owners, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, that is the architecture development in the U.S., uh, but now we're seeing straw showing up in all sorts of places, lots of different um, uh, basically bio sips or um, prefabricated structural insulated panels made with straw as a core. There's a whole host of different companies across the globe, fewer in the U.S. Um, there are compressed uh, straw panels uh, that are, you know, replacing MDF, replacing OSB, non-structural finish panels. Um, there is chopped straw insulation that can be dense packed like cellulose into walls. So when we talk about straw, it is no longer just stacking bales and covering them with a mud blaster. There's, uh, it is becoming a very, very versatile uh, installation, and not just insulation, but uh, raw material ingredient into a host of different classes of, of uh, building material categories. All right, next. All right, so now we started bringing in the operational because you know Chris and I were particularly interested in this in this paradox of increasing the carbon emissions of a building through high intensity or high emitting insulation materials in the pursuit of reducing the operational um, emissions by energy reduction and that that was a great point of fascination for us and so uh, we really wanted to make sure as opposed to structure um, really, you know, where, where, you know, there's not a direct relationship, with the exception potentially of thermal bridging between the operational phase and the decisions that are made around the building structure, that insulation category becomes quite fascinating in terms of that relationship between embodied and operational phase emissions, because there's a direct relationship there. So we want to look at that overall climate impact of these buildings. Next. So bad news, keep going. Um, if we build code compliant buildings using natural gas um, the, and using the highest carbon emitting materials that we would expect to find, um, we start really bad and we stay really bad. So to look at what we're seeing here, year 2019, you see that first yellow bar that is the embodied carbon um, profile in this case of, the, of an eight unit building using the high um, embodied enclosure materials for in a code compliant rated enclosure um, on the ISO New England grid um, using natural gas for heating and hot water. So the other things we did here, we toggled the energy sources from natural gas to all electric and even looked at differences on different electric grids and what those operational emissions look like just to get kind of like a full range of different scenarios. So that's the bad news. Uh, oh yeah, and each of these little steps is the annual operational emissions of that building. Um, you look between now and 2050, which is what um, uh, Architecture 2030, uh, Lindsay, I'm so glad you're on the call, um, has helped identify as uh, the, the industry target for uh, true net zero uh, emissions for the building sector to be able to stabilize our atmosphere to some sense of civilized habitation. So that's the bad news. There's good news. 
if we use uh, you know carbon storing the lowest you know carbon uh, emitting uh, an actual active carbon storing materials so now we're looking at fsc certified wood we're looking at um, you know straw and ag residue and cellulose for insulation materials we're looking at at all wood finishing and not plastic finishing. Uh, we're looking at very low or no Portland cement based foundation systems. Uh, we take, we make it an all electric building and we put it on the Ontario grid, which has a much, much lower um, emissions factor relative to the New England grid by virtue of their, of their, um, you know, their energy profile. Then we see we start at a negative place and we stay well below the carbon storing line by the time we get to 2050. And when we modeled this out, this is the first time I like legitimately felt optimistic about any of this work because I have just been hearing this mantra that buildings are part of the problem and all we can do is do less harm. And I just sort of intuitively refused to believe that. I'd studied regenerative agriculture for years and recognized that any system can be you know, directed to be you know, a, a negative or positive feedback loop. That's just the way the world works. And I had that same sense around building buildings as well. And it was, it was incredibly um, uh, enlivening and it gave me a tremendous amount of optimism to see that there is a legitimate path forward here. I'm not going to say that it is easy. It is absolutely not easy, but it is a potential path forward using existing market ready materials um, and levels of performance that everyone on this call is familiar with executing. Yay, next. All right, so let's look at more graphs. Um, we're gonna look at a few of these and we'll probably just kind of spin through. I have piles of these. There are so many different patterns to pull out of looking at this data together. We're just gonna draw some of the highlights and you can keep going long, long after this, this hour is up here. So looking at all this charted out, the combination of the embodied and the cumulative operational emissions between now and 2050 or 2051. Um, again, this is that same, um, same eight unit building on natural gas in New England, um, but we're kind of looking at all those different enclosure scenarios. So, that's, so high stands for the high emitting material enclosure package. Moderate is the sort of quote unquote average. Uh, low is the, the lower emitting materials that are commonly easy to find in any you know, big box building supply store. And then best being like going out of your way to optimize for the, the absolute lowest enclosure package. And again, CC is code compliant and HB is high performance. Um, so we're looking yellow, those bars represent the operational energy over that 30 year or uh, emissions over that 30 year time frame and then the red or green if it's negative represents the um the embodied phase and then the number at the very top um shows the the net of those so next let's look at it let's look at one one point here and this is maybe the most important piece and this plays off of what uh what Lindsay was calling out earlier there a high performance building made out of high emitting materials like XPS foam and closed cell spray foam can easily have a much you know, significantly larger uh, climate impact than a code compliant building using just standard, standard uh, average residential building materials. And that is super sobering. Um, Again, if we were looking at over a 80 year or 100 year lifespan of the building, we could potentially make an argument that, yep, it is worth the investment up front for those of uh, those emissions to be able to achieve uh, low operational emissions over the lifespan of the building. But the problem is that ship sailed a generation ago. We don't have an entire operational lifespan of a building to recoup all that huge plume of initial of initial emissions that come from that material development phase of the those embodied phase of the building's life cycle um we have to can I, that, that time is too short for us to ignore can i quickly jump in i always hear that like buyback that term recoup for instance and that's always really annoyed me because there is no mechanism to recoup that carbon in the first place right Exactly. Uh, once it's already in atmospheric, your building is already in the less bad phase throughout the light, its use cycle, right? So, so there is no buyback at that point, it feels like. 
I couldn't agree more. And, you know, there's a whole other tangent uh, we could spin off on and looking at, you know, carbon offset as, as a strategy and, you know, we'll plant X number of new trees and, well, you know, uh, <laughs> that there, there's a whole lot of detail uh, behind that veil that could be um, completely, you know, off the mark in terms of actual true atmospheric carbon impact within the time frame that we care about. And so, yeah, you're bang on. Those, are, those embodied emissions are fully released. There's, you know, and, and I guess your approach towards, quote unquote, buying them back would be to plant a bunch of trees and wait through their maturity to, to you know, draw back down those emissions that you initially released. All right, let's keep going. Another interesting one there is, um, you know, it's a, when, if you're, so for the purposes of this project, we were really trying to fix as many variables as possible, um, believe it or not, given all of these different scenarios. And so we assumed the, uh, while we did dynamic energy modeling simulation, so we did take into account internal gains as part of the, the, heating, uh, the heating and the cooling loads of these buildings, um, we didn't change the, the use patterns for the, uh, the internal gains of the hot water, whether it was a code compliant or a high performance building. We're really just trying to look at um, heating and cooling loads and we fixed the, the ventilation rates as well. So we're really just looking at heating and cooling loads respective to these shell changes um, and looking at that relationship. And honestly, at, you know, when, and you all I'm sure have seen this pattern as well. Once you get your operational performance really quite good, um, it, it becomes much more about, you know, that hot water consumption and those internal gains. And so, especially with a really significant embodied load, um, just focusing on climate impact reduction by your heating and cooling loads alone is actually a pretty small emission savings if you're not being comprehensive with the full package of, of operational uh, impacts, let alone the embodied impacts. Next. Um, and what was really cool is that you could build an, uh, you know, a net zero or you know, basically approximating a passive house level enclosure performance building using totally like, standard off the shelf materials um, maybe, you know, a, of a slight cost premium in some cases, um, uh, that are, that emit less carbon over, you know, net, you know, total cumulative carbon over a 50 year period or 30 year period than just the embodied carbon alone of building that high performance building using high, high emission materials. Um, so that was also really exciting because it's not like everyone has to start learning how to build with straw or waiting for someone to start mass producing straw panels for this to work. You can do that using sustainably sourced wood products and cellulose. Um, it's not this, you know, arcane technology of the future thing uh, to be able to, to realize those levels of reductions. Next. All right, well, we'll start moving a little more quickly here. Those are some of the more, the, the bigger ones there. When we took that same building and we turned into an all electric building um, and put in the ISO New England grid, uh, this is what we see. Uh, the embodied carbon profiles are all the same. The operational carbon changes a bit. All right, next slide. And so what we find is that switching to air source heat pump heating, that's what we're using, kind of your, your sort of standard residential grade mini split for all of the uh, heating and cooling of an all electric uh, building. Um, and, and we're on the New England grid, it's only a 13% reduction in actual carbon emissions. Um, now, there's a whole lot we can talk about in how um, natural gas emissions are actually calculated. There's also a lot to talk about in terms of the energy factors for electricity and what is counted and not counted there. But suffice to say, that alone is not going to be the solution towards getting us, uh, get, you know, getting our, our building's cumulative um, emissions profile down to where it needs to be, uh, let alone the refrigerant load of all those heat pumps. We'll talk about that in a bit too. Next. Okay. And actually, I think we can, we'll look at one more and then we can kind of spin through because a lot of these start to prove the same point here. The best high performance building had a total carbon footprint, 91,000 um, kilos of, of emitted carbon, um, then just the, um, the embodied carbon emissions of that sort of moderate um, kind of 
you know, you know, kind of an average material profile for a high performance building. So really start seeing how the, 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 the effect of both improving the, the energy profile and reducing the, the embodied impacts, you know, combined really starts getting numbers down to the, the levels that we want to see. Let's keep going here. A lot of these patterns become pretty similar. Yeah, it's, you can keep going. It's a lot more of those similar types of comparisons. The thing that's really interesting is when we take that same building out of New England and we put it in Ontario, where they're primarily hydro and, and wind powered and, and you know, renewable powered, you know, writ large, uh, primarily for, for, their, for their grid. Um, and all of a sudden we see those operational emissions plummet. It's the same energy consumption. It's the same electricity consumption. But the energy factor of that electricity based on that regional grid changes significantly. Um, and this is really, oh, so we can go to the next slide and really sort of draw apart that, that context. Um, once we start seeing that our operational phase emissions are that low because the grid has gotten that clean, any of those investments, and this, you know, speaks back to that earlier comment around, you know, this sort of this, uh, you know, buyback on your initial investment or the payback on your embodied carbon, there is no payback once you get to a low energy, all renewable grid. Um, it, it really all becomes about the materials at that point, And that is the place to look. Uh, I can keep going. Um, yeah, keep going again, just a bunch of other comparisons. And I mean, really, so the take home here, I'll just fall here for a second. So I guess the, the, the point that I, that I would, I would make here is that again, this is not the sort of thing where you just get to like swap out this material for that material and we're done the same way that just getting to net zero does not mean that we're done or getting your passive house certification means we did a good job and we're done. Or you put enough panels on your roof to offset your, um, you know, your meter load and we're done all the impacts wiped away. That's not how it works. Uh, if we actually look at the cumulative impacts. Uh, we see that there's these buckets of impact that live in all these different parts of the entire um, you know, uh, life cycle of energy as it moves into and through our buildings, including how the buildings themselves are created. And when we can address all of those, when we reduce the impact of the materials and actually prioritize carbon storing materials, and we build to high performance levels of, of, um, of enclosure performance, and we, you know, get fossil fuels out of the mix for the energy production of the building on site. And we do the same um, at the grid and at the utility and use renewable based um, grid inputs. Then, then all those things together get us towards this goal of carbon storing building um, and true net zero emissions by 2050. But it really is that kind of all in approach and, and really you know, achieving those emissions at, at every level um, that is, that's what's required to get there. Next. Hey, Jacob, can I ask a quick question? Uh, especially when we come to this kind of all renewable grid, that's a, the, the, um, the infrastructure is significantly carbon intensive, it looks like, for developing batteries, uh, in, in implementing the renewable energy standards, things like that. Is that still an argument for energy efficiency, reducing that total load capacity so that we don't need to, you know, battery out the entire world for a renewable grid to be sufficient? Is that part Absolutely. of the so? Hundred percent. And there's a lot that's actually not revealed in these numbers of looking at the operational factors. And so right. when you're looking at renewable, none of that balance of system infrastructure, those batteries, you know, all the inverters and chargers and all of those other guts and gears, uh, those tend not to be valued. Not only that, but, you know, hydroelectric production consistently comes up as a global warming potential of zero. Um, which is not true at all. There's a tremendous right. amount of methane production released from hydroelectric facilities, depending on their age and their ecological uh, system in which they're located and the development practice in which it was established. Yeah, um, hypothetically, we'll have less hydro in the future than we do now. Yeah, and, and not only that, the, the hydro facilities that cycle in their water levels and that are in more um uh prolific uh, botanically prolific environments like the tropics actually have very very significant emission plumes from methane production from anaerobic plant decomposition and those are tech generally not captured in these types of models so not only are you you know completely bang on that 
it's not just about the the renewable source the the uh, the actual consumption reduction has to be there because of these other impacts that's actually true just from the energy generation itself in some contexts even if it's renewable all right <clears throat> onward all right so just to show a couple of case studies here um you could show quite a number but we just did want to like confirm yes we are doing this it can be done right now we've actually been doing it for years um, at least as far as the the materials are concerned for sure um, so this is an endeavor center project uh, a teachers union building um, that stored uh, 86 tons of co2 when the when all the numbers were crunched on the material profile for the building um, it creates more than uh, it's a net positive site energy production um, all, you know, mostly local materials, very, very little waste, and, and a, a true non-toxic building. Um, the Endeavor Center has also done this really fabulous, um, uh, this is actually a prefabricated building that has been built and taken down and reassembled, uh, I think, three or four times now at this point. Um, very similar profile of, of um, you know, low ecological impact uh, bona fides and stores 24 tons of carbon. Next. And this is a little more of like, I guess, quote unquote, conventional. Um, this is a project the new frameworks did. Uh, the relatively high price tag there is actually driven primarily by pretty expensive architectural details and finishes. There are like all sorts of roofs and cut corners and, you know, fancy gables and the interior is, is, you know, it's quite tricked out architecturally. Um, and even, but, you know, off grid, totally fossil fuel free and foam free building um, that managed to store a good 600 kilograms. And that was just using, you know, local wood and cellulose insulation and, and favoring wood based finishes. Um, and this is factoring in, so it's not, none of these numbers factor in the, the MEP division of materials, but it's looking at pretty much all other building materials, including, you know, caulk, sealants, structure, paints, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and so again, I mean, the thing to highlight there, you notice that in some of the metrics, but, you know, it was also mentioned earlier um, during my introduction that, you know, our, our company is a cooperative, you know, there is so much that goes into this, not only what is required, but the dramatic potential and the stack benefits that come from prioritizing buildings that are that reduce their, their atmospheric carbon loading impact. They also have a great potential to be um, incredibly healthy, both for the occupants, but also for the workers um, working with these materials. And the waste profile becomes very, very low when working with materials that can be safely um, decomposed or easily recycled or upcycled or reincorporated elsewhere into the building process. Um, and honestly, you'll see this for, for any of you that are familiar with natural building as a movement, working with <clears throat> you know, high process based building, building process like the Timber Framers Guild has a similar, similar sort of community based, you know, pretty egalitarian, very cooperative uh, in nature as an industry and what that does to um, improve um, you know, the work life conditions for the people that are building these buildings to the um, you know, transparency and accountability behind um, budgeting and business practices to the rapid um, improvements and best practices through information sharing within the community. Um, you know, this is not you know, limited and exclusive to working with biogenic materials, but it, it, those same benefits and same patterns tend to circulate. And those, again, looking for the patterns that have those stacked benefits are exactly the directions we need to go, given the amount of improvement we have to make in how these buildings, not only what they are, but how they are produced and the amount of time within which we have to do to make those changes. Next. All right. So there are many more. Hey, Jacob, yeah. Just one thing. I just want to, we, we probably need to start narrowing down just a little bit because I just want to make sure we still have time to ask you questions. Yes. Yep. Um, I'm going to zoom through a whole series of questions to, to the conclusion here. So I'll be wrapped up shortly here. So uh, I'm going to say next a bunch, Lindsay, just to give you a heads up. I want to throw out a whole series of different questions. 
that some you're going to see one or hopefully more than one of these questions that intrigues you. And I'm going to encourage you, write that question down and make that your research project for the year ahead. There is a place to intervene for all of us in this work. And, uh, and this, these are, you know, sort of setting up, queuing up the next, next directions that we can go, uh, you know, with, with this exploration. So next, waste stream. How big are these waste stream stocks and recycled materials like cellulose? Um, are we counting the carbon from their collection and transportation? What else would happen to that waste? What is, how do we give good accountability for, to prioritize the use of recycled materials? Next. Ag residue, how large and where are these stocks? We already talked about there's a lot of straw out there, but what are the agricultural resources in your region or in the region of manufacture to take, to take advantage of? Where are there gluts of underutilized agricultural residues that we can put into use? And incredibly importantly, how is that soil and the water um, within that production cycle being managed? Because we know that is a critical part of the equation to make sure that the benefits that we're seeking are actually gonna be realized. Um, and how does that impact land use um, and maintain working landscapes? Next. Um, as we start looking at taking agricultural products and putting them into industrialized process, how do we keep um, you know, legitimate issues around social and environmental uh, justice and quality in place in the factory environment? Next. Forestry products, oh my God, this is a huge one. We could spend a long time talking about the appropriate use of sustainable wood as a, as a climate solution in buildings. It's maybe the thorniest one of all. And it really comes down to, can we validate and verify the management practices and ensure that the use of that wood is actually a net gain from the ecosystem's perspective and not just leading to deforestation? Next. All right, keep going. <clears throat> As designers, how can we start design strategies from the get-go and how we start approaching structure and approaching foundation um, in reducing the amount of material we need in the first place and finding alternative solutions to the, you know, what we tend to fall back on as proven technologies from an era that didn't have to respond to the same climate pressures as the one we're operating in now. Next. And this is a huge one. Where do you get the data to even understand that we're doing the right thing? This is really hard right now. It's getting easier. It's getting a lot easier than it has been from when we started this process, but it's still not easy. Um, and we, and you know, how do we develop a sense of smell when we do have that data to really understand what those numbers mean? We have a lot to do to, to just really understand the quantification of all of this and be able to quantify these projects uh, in the first place. Next. This is one of my favorite ones. How can we, as a building industry, ally with our partner industries in regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry to give them good, strong value-added markets? Our industry consumes billions of dollars of goods on an annual basis. So how can we leverage that financial power um, to help support the industries that we rely upon to provide the materials that we need to be able to create these carbon storing buildings of tomorrow? Next. And then what happens to these materials when, when, they, uh, when the building reaches the end of its life or gets remodeled? Um, you know, it's, I like to use not the term sequestering, but storing for plant-based materials that have the potential to get burned or anaerobically decomposed at the end of their life. So what's our end game strategy for these materials? We're really just buying time by putting all that straw and wood into the building while it has a service life. But what happens in the full life cycle context? And what are we gonna do with all that carbon then? Next. Keep going. Affordability. Um, I feel really confident just being able to say that I do not believe that single family residential construction hits any of the common markers of affordability that anyone in my community, in my socioeconomic demographic could, uh, could easily afford. Um, so if we're really looking at affordability and needing to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that these types of buildings are not only for the elite, um, we need to find new models of ownership, new ways of cost shifting, new different structures for providing shelter that are not just within uh, a commodified housing market uh, and finding that goes beyond just the materials, but it also includes the materials because if these solutions don't work for everybody, they're not going to work for anybody. Next. How do we scale this up and replicate it? And scale and replicability are two different things, um, but you know, as we know, 
this needs the, our entire industry needs to shift quickly. And this is a conversation that I hear in every different green building um, group in the world. How do we scale it? How do we replicate it? Um, and those same same issues still exist, whether it's in workforce training to information sharing to finding new ways of being able to, to scale up manufacturing. Next. <clears throat> what about the existing buildings? Oh my gosh, it is absolutely true to say that the, the most, um, that the least climate impacting building is the one that's already existing. Um, and our company has really, you know, doubled down its commitment to working on existing buildings, engaging in the weatherization and deep energy retrofit space for quite a number of years now for this very reason. Uh, and that is really challenging. It's really hard to use plant-based materials in a lot of those old funky basements. Um, and there's a lot of ha hazards and we're inheriting a whole lot of bad decisions in doing that work. And it's super unglamorous and really unsexy and uh, pretty hazardous to the workers. So how do we, how do we really you know, lean into this category of, of built infrastructure improvement? Next. Codes and permitting is a big one, depending on where you are and depending on what type and scale of building you're working on. If you're working on a big urban environment, chances are you're not gonna be building straw bale walls anytime soon. There's a lot of um, permitting and code requirement that is just going to very much narrow the pile of materials you can use for certain parts of your building. However, that's the point where you start looking at all those interior partition walls and all those finishing uh, division category materials. And there's a whole, you look at all the places where you do have some leverage and agency. Um, and for those of you that are comfortable operating in the code environment, there's a lot of work to be done there. There's a fabulous team in the natural building community, sort of spearheaded by Martin Hammer. Um, David Eisenberg's been a guiding force behind that as well in bringing straw bale into the IRC. Uh, there's now a straw bale appendix in the IRC. Same with straw clay. Um, Bruce King is amongst a group of people working right now on getting um, carbon uh, emission standards into the code for uh, concrete production. Um, so a lot of movement there as well. Next. <clears throat> All right, keep going. And this is really looking at the externalities here. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, we don't have uh, good data right now that we're operating off of when we're making decisions around renewables and the emission sources of our energy consumption. When we look at natural gas as being greener than oil or greener than coal, um, it might not be the case if we're not counting all the methane re release from all those natural gas uh, leakage points all along its pipeline of distribution. Um, so that's, that's a really big externality that's not being factored in, as well as the methane release from decomposing plants and hydroelectric facilities. So we really need a, you know, to really get a, the full picture of the impact of energy sources to be able to make better decisions. Next. Oh my gosh. I'm going to assume that in a passive house crowd, y'all are at least intimately aware of heat pump technology, if not actively specifying your projects. You put them into, you know, most of our projects. But man, does it make me nervous to see all of that really high emitting refrigerants, you know, now scattered about buildings all across North America. Um, I am not convinced that we actually have the uh, the um, the systems in place to manage all of that refrigerant responsibly. And for those of you familiar with Project Drawdown, the number one place of intervention for reversing climate change is refrigerants. So I do not specify heat pumps lightly and recognize that uh, there, is a, there is a paradox that lies within that technology. And if you have the opportunity for CO2 based systems or alternate uh, low GWP refrigerant systems, Go towards those as quickly as you can. Next. Renewables and storage, we talked about this a little bit already. We need to have a, you know, I think, you know, I'm hoping by the end of this, we all recognize that putting the amount of solar panels on your roof to match the amount that you consume on your meter is not actually offsetting your impact. It just isn't. Um, so how do we look at storage? How do we really look at the true impact of renewables um, and calculate those in as accurate and transparent of a way as possible and make better decisions off that level of analysis. Next. All right, wrapping up here. Next. So the big thing is we need each other. Um, we have to move really, really, really quickly. And we cannot wait for anyone else to do it. 
industry is not good. Some industry players are leading, but as a whole, the motivation of industry is to sustain its, its bottom line. It is not to um, save the planet. Um, you certainly can't look towards the government to do it for us, whatever scale of government, although it can absolutely be a key stakeholder and important player. But ultimately, it's going to rely on each and every one of us finding our own place of empowerment. You, know, you are all now officially standing in a leadership position within your respective communities. Um, you are now saddled with the burden of knowledge based on this impact. Um, and it is, that is the thing that we not only can do, but get to do, is learn how to work with each other better and take up more of that space in, in our leadership potential for being able to help encourage everyone from our clients to our colleagues, to our neighbors, to our material suppliers and vendors, to our sub-trade folk, to all the other people we interface with um, and help be part of communicating that message and helping each other find good solutions. Next. Oh, right, I forgot these was in here. Um, we can find heroes amongst us all. Let's keep going. Sort of skip to the end here. Yes, we need to act right now. Okay, we'll end here. Top 10 things. Build with plants that build soil and rocks made from the sky. Number two, fix what we have. Number three, focus on where materials come from and not just where they come from, but how we get them and how they're produced. Similarly, look at where energy comes from and its total climate impact and the true impact of that energy. Number five, we have to do whatever we can with current technology and also make better technology, both of those things. Number six, change the codes and educate everybody quickly, including and especially ourselves. Our commitment to lifelong learning has never been more important. Number seven, learn how to car carbon and what the numbers mean. We're just really starting to have enough of us looking at enough different buildings with enough different tools to really start understanding, um, you know, really how to start thinking about this stuff. Number eight, build relationships of mutual aid with people beyond profits. Uh, we are operating within a capitalist system. There is no getting around that. However, the more that we can find ways of supporting to, uh, each other and the communities we serve and engaging more actively in service architecture, the faster we're gonna, we're gonna achieve these goals. And number nine, building an understanding of and relationships with ecological and earth cycles that we depend upon, like understanding the critical value of soil conservation when we as specifiers in our offices and our laptops are trying to choose between this product and that product. And number 10, act with great urgency, tremendous passion, and abundant joy. Because if we don't, we are going to burn out. And the, the heaviness and, the, and depression and intensity of dealing with work on this magnitude can be crippling. I can say that from firsthand experience. And it's going to require us finding our, our passion and our joy in the work and, and leaning into each other to support ourselves as we engage in this critical work because this is the work of our careers and of our lifetimes. I'll stop there. There's a resource page on the next slide and hopefully that leaves some time for at least some questions here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I skipped through this part. This is from an older presentation that we will not get into right now. 